The Linux journal has reached end of life. Someone takes a stab at making the manual readable. System76 did the right thing. And TeamViewer goes native. All that and more, because this is another great day for Linux, everyone. Let's go. Ooh, yeah. Welcome back to Linux Weekly Daily Wednesdays. That's right. It's time to sit back, relax, and uh, take that midweek super hot, sexy break. We got the man from Finland. He's back joining us. What's up, buddy? Oh, not much. I'm celebrating Finla Finnish independence by sitting on my butt and doing nothing. Sounds pretty cool. Uh, and from the land of my former captors from Britannia. You know him, you love him. Pedro Montez. He's here every week. You got anything fun going on? I heard that your uh, diet is going to get significantly higher in fiber. <laughs> is it? <laughs> yeah, no, I got the, um, finally got the email from Sky saying that they're rolling out fiber in my area. Thanks. It only took you three months, but hey, thanks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have a whole lot to report. I'm just getting ready for the show and all that. I have been fighting with my old Nexus 10 tablet. Wow, that's not exciting at all. So we got a big show, everyone. We need to get right into sure. it. And we're not going to bury the lead. We're going to walk right into the Linux journal. Is no more. It is practically deceased, I'm afraid to say. Yep. It's, so it's, it's uh, you may have seen this news, news uh, uh, earlier in the, in the week. week. That's, that's what? On December. What? Go. <laughs> okay, whatever. Uh, on December 1st, uh, Char uh, or sorry, Carly Fairchild... Uh, posted the final uh, article saying that the Linux journal has reached the end of file. It has ceased publication because they, well, basically could not afford to keep the lights going. So uh, it is another of the dedicated Linux publications that uh, is no more. Uh, they say that they would, as much as they would like to keep it going, uh, they can't. Uh, you can still buy the full... Uh, archive from the um the linux journal uh for 25 bucks and if you do that you it's free get it's free if you're already a subscriber published. by the way so yeah Gra grab that uh, while so you can it is it is sad to see uh though that said the linux pro magazine has also offered the current subscribers of the linux journal uh, six free editions if you subscribe to the Linux Pro magazine. So that's uh, an alternative, I guess. Uh, there are sort of different uh, styles of uh, publications. The Linux Journal was always much more professional, let's call it that. Uh, I am I honestly can't remember what the last thing was that I actually read on the Linux Journal. I'm pretty sure it was one of the articles we talked about on this very show, but I can't remember honestly no man i definitely can but you know it, it kind of gives me a case of the sads it does when i see a non-clickbait yeah. publication kind of go out of existence and they've been out of print for a while yeah, I, they, they had i think it, they were still using some type of subscription model or something along those lines it wasn't just um straight ad revenue or anything like that uh one thing yeah, print magazine's basically dead. I know there's still a small mm -hmm. uh, holdout in Space Britannia, but yeah, uh, Jordan, you, you were saying it, it is definitely kind of sad seeing. Um, yeah, I mean, pr uh, definitely print media is dying, and with it, a lot of quality journalism because you know people don't want to actually pay for news; they'd rather um, they'd rather get something that is convenient and you know, speaks more to their biases and whatnot, i.e. clickbait and so on and so forth, uh, <laughs> native advertising and what have you. So it's, it's unfortunate that another one of these uh, publications is going the way of the dodo, but it's kind of expected. Yeah. And honestly, I don't think something like an alternative funding model like Patreon or whatnot would have saved them. It could have, but when you got to pay writers for, for uh, actual content, the, uh, the margins become a lot thinner, especially when you got to pay for hosting as well. Mm. So, oh, so we need yeah. to move on to 
Mozilla Envoice Nugget dispatches from the internet. This is directly from the Mozilla blog. All this business in our show notes where we like to put it there so you can check it out later. Announcing the initial release of Mozilla's open source speech recognition model and voice data set. It's a thing, man. Uh, It's kind of a cool project they announced a few months back. Has an accuracy approaching what, you know, humans can perceive currently while, you know, listening to those same recordings, it has now the world's second largest publicly available voice data set. And they have included pre-built packages for Python, Node.js, command line binaries, have currently totaled like 400,000 recordings, uh, 500 hours of speech, completely open source. Which incidentally source. is about the length of one Pedro Mateus acquisition review. Basically. <laughs> well, what are you talking about, man? It's basically, that's just the fun section for that, but yeah, ex- exactly. No, uh, that they've rocked out with the deep speech and they've made this open source for everyone to get in there to play with it in advance. Uh, you definitely were saying it's, that they were looking it, towards the future, right? Yeah. It, it, it's the smart move, right? Because, uh, there are a lot of developers that have a lot of interesting ideas involving voice recognition, especially for home automation, for um, e- even for stuff like gaming. Uh, and it basi- and it d- this basically allows for a bunch of clever people to get access to a high quality voice data set, a high quality speech recognition engine, and uh, you know be able to jumpstart their applications because. Guys like Google, guys like IBM have millions of dollars of R&D to pour into their voice recognition enabled apps. Now this, not quite, mm-hmm. but is an initial attempt at uh, leveling the playing field. And of course, uh, if more people are using Mozilla's libraries, they are more likely to contribute to them, which you know makes their offering all the more better. Uh, they're still accepting English contributions for their voice data sets. And apparently in 2018, they're going to be opening up... Um, other languages, uh, select other languages, they're probably going to be starting with like French, German, or uh, Mandarin, Chinese, or something like that. But yeah. uh, and, it's uh, one of good the things stuff. that caught my eye was the uh, the the text to uh, speech to text, sorry, uh, the other way around uh, system that they have built uh, on top of this. It has an error rate of six point five percent on the uh, Libre speech test clean data set. That's pretty good. That is actually pretty good. So for a project that's barely even started, it started this year, and they're posting just a little bit of an update on how it's going, that's actually not too bad. Kudos, Mozilla. Absolutely. And I, yeah. Trust me. I mean, in another week or two, it'll already be better than Siri. Because, wow, <laughs> Siri's bad. It's but, not a very but, high will it be a, <laughs> but will it be as sassy as Cortana? I will give Microsoft credit for this. Their their virtual assistant is actually sassy. I am 100% for sassy robots. Mm. But uh, speaking <laughs> speaking of sassy projects, uh, there, there, there is an old adage brought to you by XKCD, and it's called uh, your order of operations for running Linux commands. You use man, you use Google, and failing that, you don't actually need to know how to use this tool. But um, a group of people have decided that that's not good enough. And so they have uh, mm-hmm. created a little application called TLDR. Now, what are the if, if you've been using Linux for a while, you've obviously dug into man pages. And man pages are a bit of an anomaly, right? They were, they were originally written for utilities in the uh, late 70s, early 80s. And that sort of writing style has carried forward to this day. And if you've ever had to, you know, debug a command line application or try to figure out how to learn a new one, you're often very starved for practical examples. Sometimes uh, man pages mm-hmm. will have practical examples near the bottom, but you have to specifically go looking for them. And oftentimes they're not quite what you want. Uh, so these guys have uh, sought to do away with that entire model. Uh, TLDR posits that you just want the examples. Here's what you would want to do, here's the command to do it, and uh, it's community maintained. Um, the one, the one thing that makes me run away in terror is I see Node.js as a dependency, which means that it will download oh, 65 yeah. million other packages. Um, but I think it, it, it is an attempt at addressing a very real issue because the state of Linux documentation is not great. Uh, you have people turning to stuff like uh, the Arch Linux wiki because it's mm-hmm. actually written with human consumption mm-hmm. in mind. And I, I personally think, and a lot of people agree with me, is there there needs to be um, a concerted effort to improve the quality of man pages because they are incredibly variable in quality. You'll get man pages 
Uh, like uh, I think TCP dump has uh, it's, it's 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 either TCP dump or IP tables or Ether cap or something like that. That midway through, they the the author just goes off on like some rant that I really don't care about. Why is this in my technical <laughs> documentation? Tell me how to use the flipping program, right? Yeah. Absolutely. And I mean, this one. Go ahead. Well, yeah, uh, I was planning on it. I was waiting for you to. Um. Don't don't worry. Hopefully, Pedro's like thirty minute uh, voice relay issue will be solved shortly. I mean, to me, this looks like a collection of simplified community-driven man pages. Uh, Cliff Notes uh, is an easy way to describe it. It looks like a good tool. But since um, I'm talking about this, if you, if you have access to a terminal to pull this up, basically means you have access to links, which basically means you get access to Google. I would so. counter that by saying that a lot of the Linux help pages are not particularly well formatted for links, though. And you're going to be struggling to find the exact example you need. Yeah. And uh, to be honest, you know, regardless of the NPM and Node.js dependencies, this back in 2005 would have actually made, you know, the whole RTFM uh, spiel slightly less painful to deal with. Because, uh, yeah, you didn't really didn't want to go into the Fedora forums at around that time. It, no. <laughs> you would get no help. Well, it's like literally always... no help. It's it's not. It wasn't even like people insulting you. You just wouldn't get replies to your threads. You might not, mm -hmm. but it's interesting to see how that's changed because you've been using Fedora for a long time. And a long time, we're talking several years back. If you were doing a search, it wasn't Arch. Arch didn't exist. If you were doing a search for something, I was running. You know, I still run Fedora, but I've been using Ubuntu because production box. Long story. You would always find the answers in the Ubuntu community forums. So, uh, or or barring that, the Gentoo forums. Usually, Ubuntu, because I got really good at translating packages from Ubuntu to what I needed in Fedora. You know, mm -hmm. to the point where I didn't, I yum, wasn't even searching anymore. Yum dash dash provides. Right. Oh yeah. It's a thing. So, not necessarily Linux related. But we want to talk about it anyway. Is AM4 motherboards will support Raven Ridge desktop APUs <gasps> with a BIOS update, Ooh. and mm -hmm. kind of makes me happy because uh, I have a uh, clunky I picked it up from our wish zone for our production box, a Tomahawk B350. And the first thing I noticed is like, why is this thing get a VGA port on the? Now we know why. Also, sometimes they do cram a GPU on the chipset as well. Uh, the box that's currently running my home server, um, the Northbridge, or no, it's the Southbridge. Northbridge is integrated on the die these days. The Southbridge, though, however, uh, does have a little graphical processing unit that you can, that will do basic 2D and like very, very limited 3D stuff. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That, that, that said, though, that said, though, like um, that said, though, uh, it's it's good because the the socket differential between like FM1, FM2, and AM3, AM3 Plus was really really annoying, and it also provides a much better upgrade path and hardware longevity for your motherboard. I'm pretty sure that the motherboard manufacturers are not particularly pleased about that, but really, I just want those Ryzen APU laptops. I want that Raven Ridge on my, on my lap, given given me killing my sperm count with the with the heat emissions. I'm pretty sure the motherboard manufacturers were already planning on this because, much like Ven, my uh, Asus Prime SATA motherboard uh, has a VGA and a DVI and an HDMI at the back. I don't know why, but hey, they're there. And I guess, well, I do know why now because in the future, with a teeny tiny little BIOS or UEFI update, you will be able to use an APU there. So, yeah, that's something to consider. Oh, no. For, I mean, for me, it's absolutely practical because upgrading in the future, if I wanted to take this box or an APU in it, put it in a corner somewhere, all right, done. I don't have to worry about discrete graphics or anything like that. And or con uh, conversely, if you, uh, if you have an APU box and you say, well, I want to upgrade to a big boy processor and a big boy GPU, mm -hmm. you don't have to replace the entire kit and caboodle. It, it's always yeah. good to see a um, situation like that, and it's going to be interesting because we are moving into a future where Intel processor or well, their compute module with AMD graphics too. So 
Strange times they be, yeah. but uh, mm-hmm. yeah, enabling that is neat, of but, Intel, well, how about let's speak about disabling things. Yeah, because System76, uh, well, it's not just System76, but they made the announcement this week that they are planning on disabling the Intel management engine out of the box when you buy a System76 laptop, desktop, what have you. And this is good. This is very good. Uh, it makes those um, systems that you buy with Linux pre-installed that bit more safe. Let's call it that, because you're not always you don't always have that thing in the back of your head. It's like, is the ME doing something? Is the issue that my whatever system uh, that much slower or doing things I don't exactly expect it to? The fault of the ME. Probably not the case, but it's always something that's in the back of your mind. Well, that's not the case anymore. And, well, it's very good to see. Very, mm-hmm. very good to see. I, I think it was a very smart move by System76. And, you know, it was know thy audience, right? You know, Taco Bell with yeah. cool ranch Doritos. Know who you're selling to. Good on you, System76. And we should also note that Dell's starting to do the same thing. And, um, oh, yeah, yeah, Intel really screwed the pooch on this business. I'm not sure Lenovo will, though. In fact, I would, I would suspect that they're going to try and cram even more garbage into the management engine or at least into the BIOS. Um, but that said, bringing it back to the, the Ryzen's for a second, and we've been saying this for a while, AMD does have a similar bit of technology, the uh, PSP, not mm-hmm. the handheld, the actual uh, platform security processor. Uh, I'm curious if um, in new Horizon systems, uh, guys like Dell or System76 or whomever will uh, give you the option to disable that. Mm. I don't know. Well, yeah, we would actually need the uh, Ryzen laptops to come out and be sold by, you know, System76 or Dell or whoever. Yeah. Well, I, I, uh, I yeah, mean, no, the, the uh, management right. engine exists on the desktop CPUs as well. Exactly. So. Yes. Well, Every single one that so, uh, came out since the Arendale family, well, Arendale and above, uh, has yeah. the management engine built in. So that's bad. That's bad. That's really and bad. I thought it yeah. was kind of interesting that System76 put a list of affected products. That's unnecessary to say all of them. Well, yeah. that, 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 that is solely there for the super paranoid tinfoil hat types. Who will be like, well, now I need to buy a brand new System76 laptop. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they, they, they know what they're doing. Okay. That's not crazy I'm, enough. This is Microsoft yeah, Edge Browser. It's, available it's getting on Android. a little edgy. And iOS. iOS would be like, huh, Android. Whew. Um, what? Well, it, it, isn't the deal with iOS, though, that any browser you put on the Apple Store basically has to be a reskin of Safari? So I, I, I don't I don't know about that too much, but um, this is uh, this is definitely going to be a thing. They re- they really want uh, Edge to you know get some market penetration, or as I like to, or as my roommate likes to call it, Internet Explorer twelve. I, I am um, just checking but, out this Microsoft mm-hmm. commercial because they're usually hilariously bad. I've never. Oh oh yeah, they're they're just so happy about mobile browsing. Uh, that, I mean, no, no one in our audience is going to go out of their way to install it. But if you buy uh, phones from vendors or if you buy phones online, uh, a lot of them actually come with like Cortana or um, Microsoft uh, Office 365 apps already pre-installed. Mm-hmm. So it makes me think that Microsoft is going to start going to uh, the vendors that they're already patent extorting and saying, hey, if you don't want <laughs> us to sue you into oblivion, you're going to start shipping Edge as the default browser on Android. You know, I I think they Microsoft, like I said, Microsoft is a split ecosystem right now. You still have old dickish Microsoft that does stuff like that, but mm-hmm. you do have the other half of Microsoft that sees the futures and is definitely making the movement to let's just get our products on everything. That's kind of what I'm feeling on this. But here's something I, I want to post to everyone listening because I almost w- want to wager about Trivedi that we're going to see Edge on Linux by the end of 2018. Anyone want to take that Pepsi challenge? Oh, that, 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 uh, that's a tough one. <laughs> there, 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 there might be like uh, the as a glorif- Visual Studio Code like version of Edge. 
Yeah, like a glorified uh, chromium build that looks more like Edge than it does Chrome. So this is just make an Electron browser? Wait. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Vivaldi already did it. Why not? <laughs> well, I mean, they use Chrome and all that business. Um, yeah, I completely agree. This is uh, outside of the train wreck curiosity. It's not even strong enough to get me to install it. Because... <laughs> Chrome on Android works, period. And mm -hmm. if you don't like that, you're going to be using Firefox, possibly Opera still, uh, or Dolphin, or maybe. Yeah, Vivaldi. You won't be using Microsoft. Yeah. Are, 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 are people actually using Brave still? Send us some hate mail if you're actually using the Brave browser. Hey, man. <laughs> There's always that one person. But yeah, yeah. Send, send us some feedback on that. But, um, lads... I made a thing that maybe oh boy of questionable usefulness. Oh, oh you 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 made a video. Okay, I got a little worried there. Uh, well, no, uh, <laughs> made an instructional guide and a video. So, eh, uh, what I did? How to rename Pulse Audio devices? And yes, I fully understand. Only one, possibly seven people in the entire world will ever find this useful. Let's say you have a couple of um, DAX digital audio converters. They're the same brand, or you just don't like this nonsense, you know, of it being called CM106 or USB audio device or anything like that. And they're hard to track, set your syncs and Pavu control. Mm -hmm. I'll show you how to rename them with what I did, you know, like uh, these DAX I have currently plugged in. You know, PCM902, that's the mixer. Then we just have the two USBs. Now you can change them. Jordan input, Pedro input. You can change the outputs. And your life will infinitely become better. Not really, but this should be a document easily. De you shouldn't have to be on page two of Google to find out that this <laughs> is a thing you can do in Pulse Audio. Also, I believe it should absolutely be built into Pavu Control. But one thing I've learned about Pavu Control is don't suggest anything to that team because if you do, they'll immediately make it their highest priority never to add include that feature. So, <laughs> so you, you gotta do the reverse psychology, uh, but hey, you know, it'd be terribly unuseful, unhelpful would be the ability to rename syncs. Mm -hmm. We're on it. Uh, maybe not Pavu control, but uh, PACTL that you actually show in one of the screenshots there, because that's very not useful right now. So having the option to right click rename the, um, the sync can help. Well, it's like I still need to make a little thing because some people were talking about um, these questions I get asked because I do a lot of audio work under mm -hmm. Linux. I don't know how I became that guy, but I'm that guy now. I understand. Mm -hmm. It is my responsibility. Responsibility. I, Excuse me. I know exactly how you became that guy, but uh, we'll get to that a little bit. All right. Uh, <laughs> but look at this. I mean, if you have Pavu control, you can only go up to 150%. Say you need uh, 200%, which is what we need out of our... Um, mixer to get good levels 200 mm. percent. we have clean audio and i have 40 but you got to use pa man to get 200 percent, and you got to know how to get into it to make it do it that rhymed mm -hmm. so uh what would you want to bet you, you, what would you want to bet jordan tell me what you'd want to bet that if you had a distribution of arch that maybe i'm making this up that they would call it swag arch da 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 da, da. I'm the best. I'm the best. No, this, this, this is this is this is swagger. Uh, it's basically a um, it is a pre-configured Arch image that you can install. They set it up with uh, XFCE. They give it a little. I can't believe it's not Apple makeover, and uh, away you go. Uh, so I, I imagine this is Arch for people who don't want to read good. <laughs> Uh, because you know, part, part of the re part, I mean, let, let's be real. The, re the reason that people use Arch Linux is because they tell themselves that they want to set up their own custom system when really they just want to follow a wiki and a guide and then say that they've done that. Um, that said, um, this, this is, if you, if you just want the, the Pac-Man package manager and you know, the, the Arch street cred, you can definitely go install this boy. Uh, well, the reason I it, wanted to bring it up is because 1712 is out, and with Firefox 57, no fetch replaces screen fetch. Uh, let's see. And EFI support. Uh, use Grub. It's mm -hmm. a thing. It's there. It's, yeah. it's see, got the it's, Calamaris installer. Yeah. Uh, 
Well, this is one of those things that I wanted to actually wait till they had an update because Swagarch sounds about as believable as Hannah Montana Linux and swag, 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 both swag. of them exist. They are things. Yep. So uh, what do we have up next? Uh, Totem uh, video player, you know, that, that thing that you immediately ignore and install VLC. Uh, well, they, they have a little plugin uh, that will remember your video time codes. So if you have to reboot your computer or something crashes or you just get sick of watching uh, the Michael Bay Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie and for some reason need to pick up where you left off, <laughs> you now can. Uh, they give you some instructions on how to install it, how to tune it, and uh, away you go. But I, apparently I was wrong. You are the one person in the universe who actually uses Totem. I would kind of argue because, I mean, you definitely wrote in the show notes. You're like, man, don't nobody use Totem. You got to think about that. I, I think, you know, yes, I, I use it to just preview like segment renders and stuff I do for this show or anything like that. Why do I use it? Because it came built in. Now, I, of course, I have VLC installed. VLC, if I'm ever sitting at my desk here and uh, I watch anything, yeah, I use VLC. If Like if I'm watching any Linux ISOs I'm watching, definitely through VLC. But like quick stuff, like rendered clips and just checking video quality, uh, definitely going to use Totem because it's there. Right click, boom, and it's like, oh, or I just double click because I'm too lazy to go set for VLC. Plus VLC is actually a little heavier than that. And I don't need, you know, VDPAU support or anything like that. I need moving images like, all right, kind of full screen. Does that look all right? And I also use it to take screenshots because VLC has a weird bug where the screenshots are no longer in 1280 by 720. It's like some weird, slightly off resolution. Yeah, go look. It's there. I, I noticed this. But, but. I don't know. I don't usually don't take screenshots of a uh, video player. On my end, I just use uh, MPV because it's teeny tiny. <laughs> well, here's, here's like the ultimate point I will say is um, when it comes to watching Linux ISOs, I typically 100%, even on this desktop, is I'll use Plex. I'll use the Plex web player or I'll use it on the Android mm -hmm. devices, the Chromecast, because here's what Plex does is what this does. It just remembers, but it, it's constantly synced with the servers in the house. So I, it doesn't matter where it's at. This is neat, though, because I could imagine if you don't want to set up Plex or whatever. And uh, you can pause Squirrel, because Squirrel's a problem, I'm sure, in all of our lives. And when you come back, you don't have to spend the, you know, three minutes of going, where was I at? And yeah, man, moral of the story. Install Plex. <laughs> I, sure yeah all right fine <laughs> fair enough okay so up next we have someone who took a lot of time to show you how to install or to play around with the um plasma mobile uh, I always it's read not that exactly an mobile. iso pre-built yet uh, but if you really really want to test how kde could work on a phone or a tablet well, uh, Bushan Shah, I'm pretty sure I um, butchered um, their name, but uh, yeah, uh, they created a little bit of a tutorial that tells you how to install uh, the KDE Neon ISO into QEMU, and from there you can download the Plasma Mobile packages, just make sure you follow this thing to the letter, and once you reboot uh, QEMU, you will find that instead of the usual 16-9 portrait mode uh, aspect ratio, you, it will actually spawn a um, um, portrait sort of display type of window uh, with the login screen. And once you go in, you'll have the usual mobile uh, interface looking at you with the little phone and a couple other things down at the bottom in a little dock type of situation. And yeah, everything seems to work. Uh, they say that they will be providing an ISO, a pre-built ISO, so people can much more easily test it. But it is very much just a test right now because it's not production ready. And KDE have they have been developing this 
they, they've been taking their time. They've been, I'm assuming, hopefully, they've been doing it right. So we'll see what they do. So th- this is actually interesting because I I, ha- I have a very bizarre use case because my boss went and bought an X eighty six tablet and done installed Fedora on there, <laughs> and he's actually using like the touchscreen keyboard and whatnot because he wanted to do some development mm-hmm. on there because, uh, well, I'm well, let, let, let's take that to the other show where I'm allowed to <laughs> say naughty things, but um, <laughs> but either either way, uh, you can get a head set, head start on developing your mobile enabled KDE apps if that is your particular yes. poison. Um, could be useful if a KDE phone ever came out and was like, you know, actually mass produced and bought by people who are, you know, inclined to do so. I mean, it, it, it's an interesting little, uh, how to, I mean, it gets, it gets the job done. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna disparage it yep. for doing that. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely a thing. Thanks, Steve. Who sent this bit in. Um, I, it, disclaimer, I gotta be nice. Um, it, it, it's neat to see stuff like this, but Jordan, I gotta feel you're right. I mean, the, the only way you're going to enter the mobile market coming into 27 at the end of 2017 or 2018 is with a time machine. So <laughs> th- th- those days are over. I, I hate to say, but still good work. Uh, I listen, it's a mythical moon device for us is a good x86 tablet running linux and the thought of having yeah. a decent mobile doing that uh i i want i want to believe all right and if a kde logo has got to be flying over a greenfield with mountains in the background let, let, let's make it happen man all x files all over that so uh oh, 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 can man. we talk KDE about Microsoft nightmare service. fuel like real unadulterated yeah. nightmare fuel. Yes. So uh, there, there, there is a new generation of Furbies out. I recently discovered this as of like this week while preparing for this show. And um, apparently it's part of the Internet of crap. Um, internet of, uh, you know, the Internet of things. Um, you can you can hook mm-hmm. up uh, the Furby to Bluetooth and like sync stuff to it. And uh, some enterprising young spooks have uh, done and decided to reverse engineer the Furby Connect thing um, and, you know, see, see what they can do with it. They, they found a hex editor on board. They found a calculator on board. Um, but they figured out how to access, like, the eye animations for the Furby so you can make it, like, have fire eyes. And I, I, I just want to know, can we just hack these things to play Black Sabbath nonstop? Yes. <laughs> um here this is this is this is all right um here. it's it's fascinating right it's absolutely you give people fascinating. a bunch of free time and they will hack your furbies to have laser eyes it is i haven't looked at how much these things cost because it very well might be in the or you'll find a way to justify that purchase price range <laughs> But yeah, the whole needs a pet. (laughs) Well, no, all I want to do is um, make them do things, repackage them. And it's like, oh, look, Christmas gifts. Um, Because this is the thing um, you you need in a six year old's room that wakes up with glowing red eyes and screams, feed me, but immediately cuts off before they can focus and figure out what it is. (laughs) Yeah, just just <laughs> random see uh, the plan from a little shop of horrors. You you, you can like leave some serious serious mental scars with these things if you deploy them strategically. <laughs> yeah, you, know, you, you, you give that a double gift with this and like the Raspberry Pi enabled Jack in the Box creeper thing. <laughs> oh. Yeah, and uh, speaking of which, uh, last week we had uh, in the uh, slice of pie we talked about someone who built a uh, an Alexa Furby. Well. uh... I'm pretty sure someone's going to try that with this one because it just looks ready-made for it. <laughs> so let's talk about some good news, everyone. That's VLC. Why are we talking about VLC, man? Um, over at HackerOne, because they're introducing a legit bug bounty program. And this is good because I'm all team governments should only use open source and it should be made a public yeah. to the people who pay for the government. And... Hey, this is just one application, but it's going to be for the EU, and that's good. They get a minimum bounty, 100 watt stinky caches. And um, hey, uh, more and more companies are adopting uh, bug bounty programs, uh, except for Apple, which maybe they're about to get back into it. And Oracle. And 
it's mm-hmm. good to see stuff get wrong because you I, I hate to say it you you're not going to get the same level of testing on a product minus the incentive because people well, will I mean, hammer on things for money man like, like I said in the previous story if you give people incentive and free time they will figure out how to make your Furby scream the Levain satanic Bible at your small children mm-hmm. so uh, th- th- this is nothing but good um, the lower lower bounties are about sub 750 euros but if you uh, nab a top tier critical bug the French government will uh, fork out 2,000 euro which is a pretty sweet little uh, bonus oh yeah and one of the things that uh, this one does, it does have some rules, so make sure you read through them, uh, especially when it comes to disclosure. Um, but yeah, it's uh, basically the European Parliament is giving each um, open source project two months and every single bug that gets uh, discovered and will be uh, fixed as a result of this. Um We'll get a little bit of a bounty, which is awesome. So, hmm. yeah, it's really, really awesome. <laughs> oh, also, uh, toss Valve up on the lacking bug bounties. Cause, hey, man, uh, <laughs> Valve has its own program Private where company. if you discover a bug on Valve, they'll um, ban your account. This, this is mm-hmm. exactly hashtag truck simulator <laughs> guy. Yeah, uh, he learned yeah, that the hard it's way. A, it's a negative bounty. You find a bug, you owe us money. So uh, it used to be in the old days, like you know, way back when, like four days ago. If you wanted to use Team Viewer, they're like, "Hey, man, you can use it, but you got to use it with wine." Pedro, that has changed. Mm-hmm. Oh yes, it changed very drastically. So uh, you probably have used if you've tried to provide remote support to someone in your family, a group of friends, even at work, you probably just told them, just install Team Viewer. let me know what the uh, login code is, what the pin is, and boom, you fix their problem. Uh, but, as uh, Ven already mentioned, it used to run in Wine. That's not the case anymore, because with Team Viewer 13 for Linux, it is a native client. It comes uh, as a pure 64-bit package, no 32-bit dependencies whatsoever. They have devs, they have RPMs, and hey, it's uh, it's improvement coming to Team Viewer. You may remember that a while back they had a little bit of a snafu because someone actually managed to hack into their central servers, and basically they had the login tokens for everyone who was running um, Team Viewer at the time. They shut it down relatively quickly. Uh, And I assume they fixed that, but as I wrote this bit in the notes, I saw that the Hacker News had posted a little article saying that someone's found another pretty significant bug that allows a client to take control of the host, mouse, and keyboard inputs. Come on, Well, there is a a very (laughs) easy way around that, and that is you just got to use Wayland on your receiving machine, and then no one will be able to remote control your stuff via Team Viewer. Uh, So this this is somewhat of a consequence of them going full QT after dishing wine, as was previously mentioned. Uh, You you can't actually take control over of other people's machines if you're on Wayland, but all the desktop uh, remote control stuff is only available currently through X. Gonna give it to you. So here, 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 here's the thing about this, kids. If you ever thought that this was it was a good idea to install Ubuntu on your parents or your grandparents' computers, make sure that you get intimately familiar with this app because you're gonna be spending quite a bit of time in there. Yeah, I would argue that yeah. uh, don't give them any admin privileges. If they want something installed, you install it. That's the only way in there. Or do what I did: buy everyone Max. And like six months later, when they call you for tech support, I, I've never owned a Mac. I have no idea. <laughs> or you have a little the, bit the, of forethought. And when you do set up Linux on your uh, relative's PC, you set up Tiger VNC and forward the port in their router right then and there. So you can now, do it. Now, you, you see, if you're worried about security, you stay the hell away from VNC. You, you just yeah, yeah. Tr- run, run away and <laughs> <Yes>. scream. <laughs> so, do, do, do listen, not want. Listen, yeah, I'll agree with you. VNC follows, falls into the category of by any means necessary, though. It's a handy thing to yeah. have if you need it. I say good on them getting off the wine juice, going to QT. Interesting choice there. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sure somebody's like, uh, fix your security. 
fix your security. That, that's really all I can say. I mean, learn from it. Learn from your mistakes and keep on doing that. You got a good product. I can dig it. I can also dig all the people making this show possible, Pedro. Oh, yes. All you lovely, lovely people who have found many different ways to support the show. If you go to linuxgamecast.com forward slash support or you click the support button oh, on the nav bar. Oh, wait, wait, wait a minute. Away. Wait a minute. I, wait a minute. I, 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 hit the I, brakes. I smell strudel. Hit, everyone just hit the brakes. But yeah, because uh, we, we have these Amazon affiliate links. Uh, we, we got Britannia. You got America. Yeah, we got I, Canada. We have a new one. <laughs> we have France. And now Deutschland. Definitely representing. I, 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 I thought I smelled Wiener Schnitzel. It is a thing, man. Uh, if uh, I, Rudy, a uh, long time listener to the show, he sent in some email. It's like, yo, check this business out. We can now get free shipping in uh, Netherlands. I was like, well, okay, give me a minute. So I took care of that this morning. So if you, uh, the first, thank you, everyone who shops our affiliate links, because that mm-hmm. adds up. It's coming up on the biggest uh, spending month of the year which is doctor who mm-hmm. uh, special eve day and uh so if you're going to be ordering anything just click on one of those links that's all you have to do is there's no login whatever and um it's brilliant uh let's see what else have we got we got a wish zone a wish list on amazon where you can enable cheat mode for us and just like get on with it just get that thing and make it do that thing so I can sit back and make fun of you harder. And uh, that's brilliant. We got a thing for Newegg if you like shopping through that business and PayPal things. You know, like screw all the social media stuff, logins. I don't know. You just want cash on the barrel. That's kind of brilliant. But if you want to become our bosses, you got a way to do that, man. And Ooh, that's yeah. patreon.com forward slash analytics gamecast. Plenty of reward tiers where you get cool stuff back, early access, show notes, your own custom RSS feed for a podcast that we do you might not even know about, extra hour of content each week, name in the credits, and I can keep going. Man, we even have one. We even have one. This is not Saturday, Jordan. You have no power here. Um I was just going to say, we're, we're giving you a Doctor Who Day present as well, if you saw Oh, up. yeah. We're, so. we're going to be doing a special Doctor Who podcast and possibly a Discovery one. Look, we, we even have a reward to your cold. Fiscally irresponsible, where you can buy a spot on the show. If there's something that you really want to talk about, we'll give you that. But we want to thank um, all of the beautiful party patrons. Uh, Brad Smith just kicked in. He is a new patron. And I uh, also want to thank uh, mm-hmm. one Mr. Admiral JT. He he sent me a little gift and he sent me a little note. It'll never show up because it's white. White balance is all blown up. He he says, man, hey, (laughs) he says, had a few extra shackles this month. And what he did is he picked us up. uh, I know I have pictures of it because I installed them right there. He picked us up two additional um, Dehomotron Adium USB galvanic isolation units. See, those are the Jordan Pedro decks right there. They're. That to come through that right now. The, the, that you renamed using that handy how to that you uh, used. Hey man, we, we, we're just bringing, hey, it, bringing it all together. <laughs> oh man, the sign of a great oh. comic, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Quick jokes. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, seriously, everyone, thank you so much for because I mean this show is was a patron goal. Now it's a show, and you you guys are helping us do this, and uh, that's really cool, really cool. So. This week, uh, our slice of pie is looking, that's kind of a little scary, you know? It's got to get that extra. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a, it, that it, should it, have been it, for it the It looks Halloween. like a slice of carry pie. <laughs> yeah. It's just like, that, that's, a, that's the raspberry pie slice. He's like, I don't know if I trust this pie. <laughs> Maybe I don't. Yeah. <laughs> then then, then, then the sex you well. thing, you're like, right. then you're thinking to yourself, where'd the cat go? <laughs> yeah. That, that, that is a well, pie that looks like it's going to gonna looking... slice you. <laughs> If you want to go looking for your cat in the dark, because let's say it's nighttime, well, you can do that. Because someone figured out how to get a couple of IR LEDs and some IR cameras to work with a Raspberry Pi Zero W, which uh, actually in, uh, raised a couple of uh, issues when they did that, because the output of the Raspberry Pi Zero is actually about half of what each individual camera uses. So uh, they had to get a little bit creative with the battery and they actually used um, the charging board from a 2 amp power bank with a 1200 milliamp um, 
lithium ion battery uh, that's built for high draw, which you may find in, say, a vaping device. Like, uh, well, this one is actually we, we, slightly we, we, bigger. We get than it, the bro. One that you they vape. <laughs> yeah, the, this one here is a slightly bigger than the one that they use. But yeah, they managed to get it working and it works. Quality isn't perfect, but it does genuinely work. <laughs> It's good enough to make your own homemade sex tapes. That's all I'm going to say. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, hmm. Well, <laughs> hey, man, that's the thing. Uh, night vision? I, wait, wait. You, you, you guys don't have night vision? Uh, no, <laughs> no, I, 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 I just think vampires. where I fumble around in the dark and break things. Huh. T-I-L. So, Google. Uh, so uh, that, check that out. Uh, yeah. Go, go for it, baby. Go for it. Yeah, I was gonna say, it speaking home. speaking of cameras, uh, there is a uh, there's a Google device. Yeah, they uh, they're providing an AI camera kit with an Intel Movidius. Let me read this out: MA two four fifty image processing unit Rolls and some tongue. software to back it up. Um, <laughs> it's pretty neat. It can uh, recognize uh, either faces up to one thousand different objects or differentiate between people's and animals. You mean, I'm you just going to stop those, you right uh, there because that thing looks like it passes butter. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it might. It, that, that might be one of its purposes. Uh, but it is available if you want to, say, uh, make a little device that will, uh, say, open up a dog door for your dog or open up a dog door to let the cat out so your dog goes nuts. Um, uh, mm -hmm. it'll, it'll, if you want to make a device that recognizes bananas, we'll do that <laughs> as well. You could even, if you were so inclined, maybe combine it with the thing from the previous story for additional shenanigans. Anything's possible. <laughs> Yeah, what they did here is basically uh, through the help of uh, computer learning and all the AI stuff that Google's been doing lately, uh, they created a camera that can identify basically most animals and uh, plants that you put in front of it. Hmm. You, you well, most it most plants, you say. <laughs> Most plants, yeah, and I, I'm just going to stop you right there, because uh, one last little <laughs> bit is Vivaldi, which ironically is being displayed on Vivaldi, I know, hashtag blam, has come to the Raspberry Pi, because, hey, it's chromium, why not, and let's just throw our uh, lackady hairdo and sparkly cowboy boot magic all over it, so people can immediately disable it, because that's the first thing everyone does with your product, Vivaldi, and um, it's a thing. You, you can do it. You can run Vivaldi on a pie if you hate your... Oh, wait, no, you, you don't have to hate yourself to run Vivaldi on a pie. But, you know, it's another option uh, with everything else, to which I kind of had to ask because I remember when the pie came out. It's like, give it to me. Then five months later when they were available and in stock, I picked one up and it's like, I'm going to run X on this. I put X on this, which absolutely uh, caused a... Uh, decided case of yeah no uh -uh. that's not a good experience mm -hmm. to so i asked jordan because jordan's worked with fedora project and one of your jobs was uh you know making packages for pi and mm -hmm. um but it's like is the right pi 3 C could you theoretically not want to go play in traffic and you after using a gui desktop running x you know, it. I mean, it is. It is a quad core um, ARM v7 HL. It was just a lot better than that anemic 700 megahertz ARM v6 calculator processor that they had on the original Raspberry Pi. There's a funny story about that too. They they built the GPU die and they realized, hey, we have enough space in here if we move some parts over to stick a CPU on there. Now we have a computer. But anyways, uh, the real question you got to ask yourself is: Is the Pi 3 usable with the GUI whilst running WebKit? Uh, it's possible uh, uh, yes what gets it, it, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's someone who did a yeah, it, tiny it, has, amount. it has the ram to do it yeah uh as someone who did a td tiny amount of uh prototyping uh back in portugal go figure uh i got a chance to play it was actually the raspberry pi 2 at the time um but yes it, using just regular chromium Admittedly, I made some changes to the Chromium sauce to, you know, get the company branding and everything going. 
But yeah, all it did, all the graphical version did was it spawned a Chromium window in kiosk mode with the right-click functionality disabled. And then you plug that into the back of a TV and uh, plug the USB, uh, the USB? No. The USB um, thing for the touchscreen and you had an embedded touchscreen from a Raspberry Pi. And yeah, it does. It is slow. But it's manageable. I, I mean, it's it's early two thousands computer slow off a platter drive, right? Mm. If you're if you're old enough, you'll yeah. remember. Hey, I remember when computers were this slow. Now I have a desktop with an NVMe drive, and I'm spoiled because now I go back to the regular <laughs> SSDs and I'm like, oh, it's not fast enough. So if you says everyone's completely wrong, and you found out a way to run um, an ultra bangtastic desktop on a Raspberry Pi. You need to let us know, and you can do that by heading over to contact at linuxgamecast.com. Fill out this little form. We, we got a couple of options there. If you like this show, if you like the game show we do on Saturdays, maybe some relationship advice from Jordan, because he, he's in the business of doing that. Do our little capture, sing a little song, get down tonight, and um, we'll get back to you. It'll make it on the show. Uh, Pedro, they can also leave some YouTube comments, but we can't really promise to get to that because yes. we got a lot of YouTube comments um, with five years worth of video. So oh, sometimes. Oh, or, I mean, Pedro will get back to you and argue with you. Yeah, sometimes. YouTube because he's, Absolutely. He's, he's one of those people. Yeah. One, <laughs> of, one of those people. If you make uh, a compelling uh, enough argument that I can pick at, I will. <laughs> Yes, compelling. That that that's the that's the discriminator there. But we got we got one from uh, Josh, and he's he's talking about the Freedom Box, and he says, "What's your opinion of the Freedom Box in general, as a home server and as a smart router?" Freedom Box. Uh, what's the Freedom Box? Okay, I assumed you were going to Google. Uh, ha, 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 hush as I Google this now. <laughs> One moment. There are a bunch. Of, so, I, I, if I remember correctly, this was this may have been something from like Eben Moglin. I remember he gave a talk about something like this, where you could. Oh yeah, no, this is. Oh, I know exactly what this is. Uh, this is a uh, sort of small router box um, that is entirely open source. Um, you can use it instead of like your Linksys router or whatever. You still have to plug like a wireless AP into there if you want the Wi-Fi. Uh, but it will it will take mm -hmm. your Ethernet cord. It may or may not take uh, your coaxial cable or uh, DSL line. You may need to actually have something in bridge mode to handle that. But effectively, it is a router or personal server bridge device that allow that will, in theory, respect your privacy. Mind you, Evan Moglin doesn't really respect the FSF anymore. But you know that's that's another story for another day. Um, but I mean, uh, one of the so things I, I noticed I, I, is that this one is completely Linux based, unlike your standard routers, which use some variants of BSD, most likely. Uh, this one's all Linux. Yeah, um, there, and, and I mean, the reason they use BSD is they can do whatever the hell they want with it and not have to, you yeah. know, <laughs> release hide nor hair of the modifications they made. But like I said, uh, it's an it's an interesting little theory. Once upon a time, I had a plan to like set up a small peer-to-peer -peer network using a bunch of uh, Guru Plugs uh, top boxes mm -hmm. to essentially create like a like a very very trimmed down sort of social file sharing calendar chat um, application that never really came to fruition. It was all going to be based on SSH keys, but this is it, it's essentially it, it's an interesting little uh, concept. But again. Uh, most people are not going to care about it. Yeah, I mean, much. with something like that, I mean, you can always deploy Synology. And... <laughs> don't 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 get me started on Synology. <laughs> okay, I, I, I will I will I will say mm -hmm. though that uh, one one of my pet projects is to get uh, a nice little sixty four bit ARM machine that can act as a router and use it uh, in that capacity as sort of like a centralized routing home server. If you want to get one and you want to hack it up a little bit and install all the business, you can. Repurpose it as a Plex box. They're not cheap, but they're called Drobos. Yes. Yeah. They have that everything, is. including the networking built into them. Um, this much cheaper option. Uh, when it would come to a device like this, I would either buy something that would be m not overkill, but something spec'd out a little bit better because I'd need it to do more than what this would be capable of to justify it, or it's something I'd build out of spare parts out of the tech closets. You know, yeah, yeah. It, it, you you could probably build your own. It's a fun little uh, DIY project. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and I mean, it comes it comes from a place of like wanting to protect your privacy and consider and also considering the fact that most uh, wireless edge devices are horrifically unsecure mm -hmm. and do not receive firmware updates. Uh, it may be a thing you want to consider if you are one of those uh, privacy minded peoples. That is true. Um, hey, that's going to do us. We, mm, we we did it in under an hour, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, 55 yes. minutes. <laughs> So that means we immediately have to screech over and hit the credits buttons. Original series, that's right. This is original series, man. Listen, no one had ever done a Linux podcast before we showed up. Absolutely no one. No, sir. Some dude in Finland. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you to our executive and producers and regular uh, producers. Who keep supporting the show. Oh, look, he... Uh, yeah, keep Pedro, I told you, don't, those... don't say support the show. Say, give us money. That, I mean, that's what I do. <laughs> Come on, man. I'm finally getting used to saying supporting the show. What are you doing? <laughs> l l l listen, people, people respect directness. You just got to say, give us money, stuff those dollar bills in our G-strings, and we will dance for you. <laughs> we'll even take you back to dollar, the champagne room. Bill, I, maybe give you a little special present.